Hi, Mac. How are you doing? Good. That's good. So, can you please start at the beginning, when you were born and where you were born? I was born in Scott City, Kansas. And what is the year that you were born? 1924. 1924. And who are your parents? Uh, Grace and Jacob Rowe, R-O-W-E. And how was your growing up in Kansas? Well, I only lived there till I was nine, and it was good, but uh, dust storms and everything come, and and uh, my dad was a, a what they called a stockman, and he uh, uh, bought and sold stock of all kinds. And he couldn't grow anything on the farm, and it just forced us to come to Arizona. I had a brother and uh, a sister-in-law and a nephew living here in Prescott. And then uh, where we went first was down on Buckhorn Creek. That's up off of Castle Creek. And uh, I had a, a sister and a brother-in-law that lived there. And they had come to the Arizona for his health, and uh, I think he had had uh, tuberculosis, but he got cured of it. So, yeah, it was quite a place down there. I, uh, uh, Bonine Ranch was quite a place. They had uh, Angora goats and cattle both. And they, uh, back years ago, they used that Angora goat hair for car seats and upholstery and, and all that. And uh, it, it was quite a process. Uh, they had uh, what they call Bosch from Spain that come over and they was herders. They were goat herders, and, and of course, there was a lot of sheep in the country, too, and sheep herders. And they would train dogs, and those dogs were fabulous. It was just like having another person, because they would do everything that herder said. And so did you live for a long time at the Buckhorn Ranch? Uh, or the Buckhorn Bone. Creek, that's what it was on. It was the old Bonine Ranch. No, we just lived that summer, more or less. And then you also got to interact with these uh, Basque sheep herders. Oh, yeah. Boy, they could sure cook. They used those Duff ovens, and they could make the best cobbler you ever ate in your life. <laughs> right, they'd use canned peaches and stuff, you know, and and uh, use old sourdough for the dough, and boy, it, w it was delicious. <laughs> yeah. And did you eat any other interesting food? Oh, lots of it. Beans, I've had real good beans, pretty hot. <laughs> but uh, one time, one of them was telling me, and he was taking, and uh, well, he was wiggling his thumb, and he was telling, pointing at the meat, and he, and I figured, finally figured it out. It must have been rattlesnake he was feeding me. But we ate a little bit of everything down there. Uh, we ate burro meat and goat meat and whatever you could get. And from the Bonine Ranch, where did you move to? We moved up here to Prescott. 
and we lived over on Brush Street for a while. And right above Brush Street is where a lot of that granite rock come from in the post office downtown. Yeah? And so what school did you go to in Prescott? Well, I went to Lincoln, Miller Valley, uh, junior high school, and high school. And yeah, that, that would see it there. And how was it growing up on Brush Street? Uh, we only lived there not too long, but it was fine. Uh, I didn't care too much for Lincoln School. They didn't care too much for me. Uh, it was mostly all white kids. And it was a rich people's school. They may not like that in their interview, but it's the truth. And uh, I had come off that desert down there, and I was real dark from that. They called me names, and I got so I was pretty ornery there. <laughs> they didn't like me any more than I liked them. And but, so from, oh, go ahead. So then, uh, then uh, I went down to, to uh, uh, Cache in Arizona and stayed with my sister. Uh, no, that was later. That was later, I'm sorry. I went to Miller Valley School then, and I went with all nationalities, Indians, uh, Kachanos, uh, 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 two colored boys, uh, Calvin and Melvin Good. And uh, Calvin uh, is, uh, or he may still be alive in Phoenix. Uh, he's become a lawyer. And uh, he was tall and Melvin was short, and they were twin brothers. <laughs> but Melvin finally drank himself to death. Same thing with a lot of my friends, yeah. And from Miller Valley, then, where did you move to? Well, I went down there to that one year at uh, Cashin. And went down there with uh, Oaky boys and and Arky boys and uh, uh, they could sure fight. <laughs> and then from there, did you graduate or were you still moving around? To uh, then I come back. I come back up here and uh, went to junior high and then. Uh, what time I went to high school, and yeah, the old junior I used to set up there right on Gurley Street where the sheriff's building is now, and it was a junior high. Yeah, it was a good school, good people. Yeah. And uh, when, uh, around this time is when you met your future wife, or when did you No, meet? later, uh, when I was going to junior high school. I'm, she, uh, her mother and my mother went to the old Church of God there, and uh, my mother would make me go if she could, <laughs> and I, Kind of met my wife then, and I went with other girls too, but later on my, uh, she running the same group I did, uh, and we all 
run together and and I was eyeballing in her. <laughs> yeah, and she was even pretty then. And, yeah. And so how was it growing up in Prescott? It's a wonderful place to grow up. Lots of Mormon people, good people. I know lots of Mormon people here in the Pioneer's home that uh, and you know the Mormon people their kids never hardly ever got in any kind of trouble because they were pretty strict on them yeah and so when did you get married or when was your first date with your oh I can't tell you when the first date was that had to be in early 43. So then you got married on March 19th, 1943. On f March 14th. 14th. And then uh, I, I was working at the time at Belmont, Arizona. I was, uh, uh, that was a ammunition dump up there, we called it. And I hauled Indians, and that ammunition dump up there, I don't know how many hundred miles that covered, but they had these what we called igloos, and they had them all separated, so if one of them got bombed or something, they wouldn't blow up the others. And it was cold, and I was hauling those Indians in a tractor and trailer. And I mean, it was cold. And them Indians, I, I, I always got a big kick out of them. They, they're pretty, pretty sharp. Uh, if you didn't uh, watch them, uh, a couple of times I'd get to a place uh, where I was taking them, a load of them, the igloos, and they wouldn't be enough Indians. And because of what they'd do, they'd answer for each other. Of course, the white man had a bad time trying to pronounce some of their names, too. But they got smart with that, and then after that, if you answered, then you had to walk over to the other side. <laughs> Otherwise, that Indian probably didn't show up. <laughs> but they were good people. <laughs> I loved them. <laughs> was that your first job? I started working ever since I was little. Because, like when we had the stock farm, if you lived on a farm, every kid worked on a farm. Main thing was cleaning the manure out. <laughs> I've done a lot of that. <laughs> uh, but uh, then uh, uh, that year that I lived down with my sister and brother-in-law, I'd done the washing and the cooking. Because uh, my sister was the postmistress there, and my brother-in-law had the garage and the trucking outfit. So they was busy. And, and yeah, and then uh, every summer and every uh, Christmas vacation, I would go down there and work. I'd done every kind of job there at the garage, you could think, fixed tires, drove truck, and everything. And I drove truck off of the Tenney Mountain up here when I was 14 years old. I was, we were hauling the goat poop. <laughs> and uh, my brother that was 10 years older than me, while we, uh, he was in partners with my brother-in-law, and my uh, brother-in-law uh, had got 
first time I uh, hauled off the mountain there, he got blood poisoning in his arm. And, and he, my brother-in-law would get drunk and I'd have to drive. <laughs> but, you know, such is life. <laughs> yeah. And so you drove a lot then. Oh, I drove truck for a long time. So uh, I drive truck every summer down there for my brother-in-law. And uh, then finally, after I quit school and I went up to uh, Belmont, and uh, I got a job there hauling the Indians. And uh, uh, that, I was just a little old skinny kid, and he said, can you drive a truck? I said, I can drive anything you got here. And he said, okay, go out there, see that new tractor and trailer? Get in it and take off. I did, and I drove around, drove back, and he had told me, when you get back, pull it up there and back that trailer into the dock so you can load the Indians. And I thought, I, I never did drive a tractor and trailer, but I drove truck. <laughs> so I made up my mind, I'll, what I'll do there, I'll make a circle and I'll come up and I'll get right in line with that dock. And I backed it right in perfect. And that guy said, you're hired. So I worked there for a while, and that's when the wife and I got married when I was up there. And then she, uh, uh, she got sick up there. So then we come back to Prescott, and I was called into the Army then and served a long time overseas in World War II then. And yeah. And then come home, and yeah. so long ago now. And then our daughter was born finally in 48. Yeah. She'll be 70 years old the 30th of this month. <laughs> yeah. That, far as I'm concerned, of all the things I've done in my life, that was one of my greatest achievements, was her being born. Yeah. And how many other children did you have? Just her. Just her? My wife couldn't have any more then. She got sick. Yeah. And, but, go ahead. But her and I, the wife and I, why? Well, we square danced and we hunted artifacts and we had fun. And then later we traveled all over the West, had lots of fun. Yeah. And then I wound up losing her last year when she was 91. She had cancer of the lung and the brain, yeah. So that's the highlights of my life. <laughs> and where did you buy your home when you got married? We bought a cabin over on Mile High Drive. Didn't have water in it, and it's all it had in there it was just a tiny cabin, and it had a little tiny, one of those little stoves and that was the heat, but it did have lights in it, but no water or nothing. And I started fixing it up, and I put a bathroom in it, I put everything. And my dad helped me on some of it, and some of it I just done myself. And then we lived there, and. Then when I got out of the mine, when Laura made me take get out of the mine because some of my friends were getting killed underground, why, 
I got the station in the garage, and I had that for 10 years. Then I worked for Lamb for 10 years. And then I done everything you could think of. I walked, worked for Stanley Lumber and fixed their equipment and hauled lumber to the Grand Canyon. That's when they was building a lot of new houses in the Grand Canyon. So I drove a truck up there and hauled lumber. And then I got a job at uh, Lowell Prescott, it was his name, and uh, he had the wrecking yard, and I run that for a while. And then he closed it up, and we sold everything. Let's see, where did I go from there? Oh. But after I quit Lamb, I went to work for the Nissan, Jerry Scott. I was their service manager for a while until he sold out. Seemed like everything I would do, some of the, they kept selling out. <laughs> Maybe I was the cause of it, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And so Let's go back a little bit. And okay. When did you first hear about Iron King Mine? Well, see, I was driving the freight line truck from uh, Prescott to Crown King, and I d would deliver stuff there in, in 46. Or, and uh, I knew a lot of guys there. I knew... Johnny Mallory and, and Mike and a whole bunch of them. And uh, Mike, he was the warehouse man, and I asked Mike, what do you do to get a job here? And he told me, go see a so-and-so, and I can't remember who that was anymore. So I went and seen him, and uh, I did uh, about... The third week, I think, I would, that I delivered there, I'd go and see if I'd get a job. And he said, yeah, when can you come to work? And I said, well, i got to give my boss a couple of weeks to notice. And uh, I gave my boss a couple of weeks, and he said, well, he said, stay one week. I got somebody else hired, so I told them at the Iron King then that uh, uh, when I'd be available, and they said, come to work on that day. And I worked a short time on top. That's what they do. They put you on the bull gang, and you work there, and then I went underground and become a miner. I didn't come uh, really, I worked underground, but I didn't come become a miner, I think, until about late 50 or maybe 51, I can't remember. But I done all kinds of mining. I worked in the stopes and at raises and the only place I never worked underground was in the shaft. I never worked there. Yeah. You get kind of addicted to working in the mine. I guess the main thing you like about it is the fact that uh, nobody bothers you after you become a miner because you know what to do. Maybe they'd check on you. Maybe they wouldn't that day. Maybe they'd just holler up at you or something and see if you was all right. <laughs> yeah. But you made real good money. That was the thing. That's why I went there, to try to make some money so 
Laura and I could have some things. Because Laura never had nothing in her life. She, it was really tough for her. So we got so we doing pretty good. We built on that old house over there and about the only direction we didn't build. No, we built on that direction too. We built all around that house, <laughs> that cabin. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, when I got out of the mine, uh, we still had the old cabin over there, and we decided that uh, we'd like to have a new house. So we built that new house up there in uh, uh, Prescott Heights. And uh, I, I done real good in the business, too. Because all those years I worked in the mine, I had a mechanical shop at home. So I done that. Okay, Mac, I was wondering if you can tell me a little bit more of some of the memories that you have when you worked at Iron King Mine. Well, I remember a lot of the guys. I worked, uh, the, this one guy I worked with, his name uh, Buster Igo. That was his name, Igo. He was from Wisconsin or someplace up there, and he was quite a character. And he's the one that he and I were working underground, and we were square setting. Uh, everybody wouldn't know what square setting was, but it was taking the rock out and putting timber in to hold the ground. We come back on a Monday, and it had all caved in. We would have been killed if we would have been there. So those things happen, and you just, you know, when you're a minor, you... <laughs> and the one I, I, that I get the biggest kick out of was a guy by the name of Swede Morris. And he was an older miner, and uh, he and I were working together uh, underground, and he was telling me, he said, you know, Swede Morse isn't my real name. And I said, well, I had that figured out. But he said, I'll tell you what happened. He said, I got in a fight with a guy, and I, and, he never did tell me for sure that he killed him, but I think he did. And he said, the sheriff got drunk, and I got the keys and got out, and I stole the sheriff's horse. And that was way down in Texas someplace. And he said, I rode day and night, and he said, and this is where I wound up here in Arizona, and that's why I'm Swede Morse. <laughs> but they, those guys, some of them was the biggest characters you ever met in your life. <laughs> Finlanders, a lot of Finlanders was working there. They all chewed tobacco. I never could chew tobacco. It made me sick. <laughs> but, yeah, there was really some good guys. All the Mallory Oaks and Jimmy Murray and uh, was a good buddy of mine. They're, they're, all of them are gone now. There ain't none of them alive. Yeah. And uh, Mike, I... Uh, he was a decorated soldier, Mike Malioric, and Johnny was too. He fought in Italy. He was a machine gunner, Johnny. He's gone. His wife's gone. All of them are gone. I miss them to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
and they called me Junior because I worked with Bob Hurd and he was a big old tall skinny guy and I was tall and skinny. And so they just started calling me Junior so that, well, Pete might have said that to you too, did he? That uh, they called me Junior. That's all right, <laughs> long as they paid me. <laughs> And who taught you your trade as a miner? And who was your partner also? Oh, I had a lot of partners. Because if you'd get it, uh, uh, like if you'd work the ground out where you was working, why, uh, then they might split you up. And I worked with uh, Bernie's stepdad that's here. He... Uh, he was a miner. He was just a kid when I worked. Uh, Roy Haining was his name. And I worked with him underground. And he and I, uh, I think uh, he and I is when we made the most money. Because we had, uh, uh, there's such a thing as good ground and bad ground. And this was good ground we was mining in. So that was less chance of getting hurt and everything else. Yeah. And then I worked with old Tom Phillips. He'd been a city cop, and he couldn't mine. He never was a very good miner. <laughs> yeah. And old Tom, <laughs> old Tom, he, he was a character too. He said uh, to me, he said, w uh, he and I and, uh, uh, see, who else? Bud Webb and uh, uh, w Wilford Coyview, he was a Finlander. We was all working in this huge stoke. The biggest stope they ever had, and I think that was on the 1200. The ore had just bulged out to where it was. I think it was 35 feet wide in there. Where we it was a bunch of us. But old Tom Phillips, he, he said, you know, yeah, he said, I thought when I got old, he said, I'd have silver in my hair and gold in my pockets. And he said, here I am, he said, bald-headed and lead in my, you know what. <laughs> but they was, some of them were the biggest characters she ever met. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned to me one of the things that we talked about when I first visited you is about the Mexican miners. Oh, yeah. You soon learned. You had to learn a certain amount. Yeah, some of those old miners, that's all they had done. They had never done nothing else. They had just mined. A lot of those, I can remember those. And Babe Dominguez's stepdad, and all them, and the Hernandez's and the Sarianos, and a lot of them, all their family ever done was working the mines. Yeah. Connie that's in here, her husband died here since I've been here. Uh, Carrillo's? Yeah. And they come over from uh, Jerome in 1952 when Jerome closed up and come to work at the mine. So I, I talk to Connie every day. I did talk to her husband when he was alive here. But uh, Jesse Bias, he come over from uh, uh, Jerome. Good miners. They was all excellent miners.
very good miners. Yeah. Yeah. Jesse, he's gone. All, all of them are gone. I, I don't have, even Babe, he's gone. Yeah. And can you tell me, you mentioned that there was one of the miners that was uh, Yaki. Yeah, that was Marcus and uh, Kusus, his dad. They were Yaki Indians. Yeah. Uh, Marcus was well educated. He could talk, but his dad, uh, uh, old Kusus, he couldn't. Hit. And uh, 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 we had a miner, John Garber, and he was always pestering. Uh, Casus, and Casus uh, uh, was pretty superstitious, and John would say, "Do you hear that, Casus?" <laughs> you know, and he was just aggravating him all the time. But they was good friends, even yet. <laughs> yeah, and Casus. Uh, 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 the mine got after him. He had a whole bunch of checks that he hadn't cashed. And they said, they got after him, said, you got to put that money in the bank. You got to uh, cash those checks. And he said, oh, no, bank's no good. He remembered 29 when the banks went broke. He might have had a little money in there. <laughs> but he was a good guy, too. Marcus was, too. Johnny Hernandez, I worked with him, and then he quit and went to Baghdad and uh, as a bookkeeper. A lot of them quit and went down there. Frank Williams, he quit at the Iron King and went down to Baghdad and went to work. A lot of them did, because uh, most of that then was uh, open pit. Open pit's a lot safer than underground. At underground, you never knew when you was going to get hurt. I got things all over me that's been banged and battered. And, <laughs> and did you think that your job was dangerous? At a point? Yeah, you got, you kind of, you liked it, though. It was dangerous. You had to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, uh, Pete Haydorn that used to have the salvage yard years ago, uh, he was working in that big stope opposite shift uh, from us, and the rock fell and broke his back, and he never did mine anymore, but he had the recycling shop and done real well and made a lot of money there, and uh, he died, and uh, his wife gambled everything off. That's the way Coles wound up owning the the recycling yard there. And uh, old Pete had his uncle there that lived upstairs there in the old barn there on Navajo Drive. And, uh, but the way Pete made a lot of money in the uh, recycling yard, uh, <coughs> Uh, Phelps Dodge closed the smelter up and everything at Clarkdale, and Pete bought all those buildings. He bought them for practically nothing. And his brother uh, went over there and a couple of other guys, and they salvaged all that metal big A-frames and, oh, they was, they was probably a million dollars there worth of, of stuff. 
And old Pete made a lot out of it, too. But Phillips Dodge, you know, wanted the, well, I guess the city of Clarkdale wanted him to get him tore down. So old Pete bought him and tore that down. And yeah, Pete was a good guy, too. And what is a favorite memory that you have of working at the Iron King Mine? <laughs> Probably when we were all drinking beer and we was having a barbecue. <laughs> we used to have one of them every year. Uh, the uh, We had a union. Uh, and uh, you put a little bit of money into the union, so we had a lot of money in the union. I, I can't remember whether it was the Teamsters Union or the Iron Americas Union. I can't remember what that was anymore. But we'd have two guys that would go and dig a pit, two miners, and build a real hot fire in it, you know, and then put these rocks in, and then put the beef down in there and cover it up. And boy, that beef was good. And we had everything you could drink, beer, whiskey, and everything else. And, <laughs> and the food was really good. Yeah, and, and we'd have a lot of fun there. But uh, we got along good at, at the mine. Everybody kind of liked everybody. And so this party that you were talking about where they would put the beef in the ground and cook it, was this the yearly Iron King picnic that you were talking about? Yeah, it's all Iron King. And the Iron King, though, could bring anybody they wanted to, and they'd bring all the families and everything. And I can't even remember where it was cooked, someplace out by Humboldt. But I can't remember that. I forgot that. I hadn't even thought about where that was at. <laughs> yeah. And what what did you guys do for fun, like after work? Drink. Drink. <laughs> <laughs> that was most of us. And I heard from some, I don't know if it's from you or somebody else that was telling me a story that sometimes there was bare knuckle fights. Oh yeah, we'd get in fights, but that didn't make any difference. Uh -huh. And um, I don't know, is there um, a favorite memory that you have of one of your fellow miners that you want to talk about? Oh, I had a lot of them. Bud Webb was a good friend, and Roy Haining, uh, Bob Hurd, there was a whole bunch of them that were just real good friends, yeah. Yeah, good miners, all of them. And how many do you think Mexican miners worked at the Iron King? Was it a lot, a little, medium? Oh, they was a lot of them. And was one of your partners Mexican? I thought you told me that one of your partners... Well, Babe, and De Babe Dominguez and I, we, we worked for a while together. Uh, and Pete, Pete Arredondo and I, we mined together. Yeah. Pete, he had a, a son that uh, got killed down on Whiskey Row. They got in a fight, and the guy, uh, I think, shot him. Yeah. A lot of those things like that happened. And, yeah. 
And did a majority of the Mexican miners live in Prescott or in Dewey Humboldt? Well, they lived everywhere. They, some of them lived in here, down in what we call Mexican town then. And uh, that's where Tony DeVitris is. He was Italian. That's where his, his mother lived down there. She was alive then. And I guess Tony's dad had been a miner too. But Tony worked for years before going out and working in the mine. Uh, uh, he worked for uh, Mallon Brothers. They had a, uh, uh, where they heated metal and made ban uh, man covers and stuff like that. So they, you know, yeah, I work with a lot of them. They're good, good workers, all of them. There wasn't nothing wrong with them. And then thinking back on your work and your experience at the Iron King Mine, what information do you want to tell future generations about the miner at Iron King and your experience? Don't work underground. Because <laughs> you get banged up and it just, uh, it's, it's pretty hard life. Yeah, because you told me you had an injury, right, that really, that your wife got worried about you. Well, I broke that kneecap, I broke that foot, I broke fingers. There's always something, because it's so dangerous, you know, yeah. And then when Harry Corley got killed, that's when my wife said, come here, that's enough. You got to get out. And then I got out and had my business. And I had good friends that helped me get into that to begin with. I even went to Mobile Oil School in Phoenix. They had a school they sent you to. And I went to that. And where did you have your mobile stations? In Miller Valley, 649 Miller Valley Road. <laughs> it's a nail salon now. <laughs> <laughs> How would you like uh, your memory of your work and your experience at the Iron King Mine to be remembered? Oh, we had, uh, Hap Mills was a superintendent when I went there. He was one of the finest guys you ever met. Boy, we never, when we had the union, no matter what we asked for, we got it. There was no hassle or nothing. We'd always get a raise and pay and everything else. And we had some, really, and then Hap finally retired. And, and then we had another guy, and I can't, I'm at a loss for what his name was. He was good. We had some good ones. But as what ruined the old Iron King, Elmer was the uh, uh, underground superintendent, and he had worked down by uh, Miami and Bisbee, and he was always wanting to mine it the way they did there. And what we used at the Iron King, most people won't understand what I'm talking about, was called a cut and fill. And, but and when he got this later years after I'd already left, is say he would just go in and blast it down and just take enough ore out and, and 
do it altogether different than what we had used to do it on a cut and fill. On the cut and fill, you'd take a cut out and then you would fill it with waste. And but and then the ground, when he doesn't start doing that, all that ground started moving. Yeah, when they'd pull the ore out of it. <coughs> That's some of my iron king. Do you have impact on your lungs then? What do you oh, yeah, I got COPD. Mine, they call mine pulmonary fibrosis. I'm, mine is, my lungs look like this. But heck, I still, I use my, uh, you can see I use. Uh, oxygen at night, mm -hmm. but I do okay during the day. Yeah. And then, um, how do you think the memory of the Iron King mine should be remembered? Of all the good people that worked there. And I, I don't know, is there, um, Anything that you want to talk about of how you were treated as a worker, uh, any additional information that you want to provide, I guess, so it'll give We you was treated wonderful there. They really treated us good. Even after Hap Mills retired. But Hap was, uh, he was the one that Anything that would happen, it was taken care of. Yeah. Yeah, there was, there was some fine people that worked there. Of course, there was some, you know, you'd, I don't need to say it. <laughs> a. <laughs> yeah, and I had a, and then I worked with Ralph Bennett. He was good. He was a good guy. He would, he was World War II. Lots of us were World War II, yeah. Yeah, Jimmy Murray was World War II, and a bunch of the Hernandezes, yeah, yeah. Is there anything else that you wanna just say to make it as part of your oral history that I might have missed some of the questions. Nah, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> How long have I talked for crying out loud? Yeah, you've talked for almost an hour. Well, that's enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Mac, for Oh, I loved it, yeah and bring back those memories of all my friends that are gone now.